are in the back of the house on the left and the right. Thank you for joining us. Hi, I'm Leonard Lopate, and welcome to the Green Space and uh, to the first of a series of talks that accompany our presentation of August Wilson's American Century Cycle. At the heart of this evening's discussion is a collaboration that began while Lloyd Richards was the artistic director of the National Playwrights Conference at the O'Neill Theater, and he was sifting through more than a thousand scripts submitted by aspiring playwrights one that caught his eye was from an unknown writer named August Wilson, and the play was Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. They went on to take it to Broadway and to form one of the most successful artistic partnerships in American theater when Lloyd Richards then directed five other plays by August Wilson, Fences, Joe Turner's Come and Gone, The Piano Lesson, Two Trains Running, and Seven Guitars. We're exploring that partnership tonight with five people who knew and loved these two extraordinary men, and it is my great pleasure now to bring them out, starting with Constanza Romero, theater designer, Mr. Wilson's widow, and the executor of the August Wilson estate. Oops, I'm in front of your seat. Lou Bellamy, Artistic Director of the Penumbra Theatre Company and Obie Award-winning Director of Two Trains Running at the Signature Theatre, and he also directed many other Wilson plays. <laughs> Lou Bellamy. <laughs> Todd London, Artistic Director of New Dramatists. He presented a Lifetime Achievement Award to August Wilson in May 2003. Ebony Joanne, who performed the title role of Ma Rainey's Black Bottom in its debut and in the 2003 revival on Broadway and also a number of other productions over the years. And Stephen McKinley Henderson, <laughs> Associate Artistic Director of The Cycle. He's been in Jitney, King Hedley II, Ma Rainey, Seven Guitars, probably a couple of fences, right? <laughs> And I'm so pleased that you're here as well. Uh, so let's begin with you, Constanza. What kind of, or maybe I'll throw it out to everybody, what kind of director was Lloyd Richards? Was, was he one of these very controlling directors? No, he was very quiet. Um, when I was brought into the uh, whole experience, I was brought on as the understudy for uh, Teresa Merritt as Ma Rainey and Alita Mitchell as Dussie May. I was at that age where I could do both roles and sing. <laughs> so oh, I had the opportunity to understudy both roles. And one of the things that Lloyd said to me on the first day of my rehearsal was to sit, my job was to sit and watch everything that went on, listen to everything that he said, and listen to every, just know everything that I see. And that was that. He's the kind of director that spoke very quietly to his actors. He was not, um, he wasn't demanding, um, he did a lot of whispering, which meant I heard nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so he pretty much trusted you. You were cast in well, the play. Well, I'm not so much. Uh, well, trusted me, maybe, yes. But I, he had lots of things to say to the actors uh, during the rehearsal process. He would spend a lot of time with them. But he didn't realize how softly he spoke. And um, that was just a wonderful thing about him because I've worked with a lot of other directors since then and some of them can be rather intimidating and loud and boisterous and bombastic and he was none of that. Any uh, else, anyone else here worked with Lloyd? Uh, 
Oh, you did, of course. Yes, yes, I did. I, but um, on another level. Yes, I was, a, I was a costume designer. I came in in my third year at Yale to design um, the premiere production of uh, The Piano Lesson. Mm. Um, but I do want to share that um, to get cast by Lloyd Richards was definitely considered, you know, definitely by the time I was working on Piano Lesson, a, a big honor, uh, especially working on a new August Wilson uh, and one of the things that I do remember is that um, this, the kind of respect and the kind of uh, the, the, the seriousness around the room for that very first read-through for the piano lesson. You know, it, it was, a, it was a definitely a work in progress, but uh, I definitely remember there was a lot of, you know, this is momentous. Mm. Right here, right now, we are here, and and it was very special. Was that production when you met August as well? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, how did August Wilson and Lloyd Richards meet? Uh, was that uh, obviously it was after he decided that uh, Ma Rainey was something that he was going to want to produce? But um, uh, he, when he retired as dean of the Yale School of Drama and artistic director of Yale Rep in 1991. Uh, Wilson wrote a skit that described him this way. He's a big man, but he don't act like a big man. He can go anywhere and sit with the uh, with his back to the door because he knows he ain't done nothing to no one. How many men can sit with their back to the door? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that, that's quite something. Uh, uh, I, I mean, Lou probably knows this, but uh, I, I studied with Lloyd on a Fox Foundation fellowship for three years. And uh, uh, so I, I never was directed by him in a Wilson play or directed by him in any play, but often in class. And in, uh, in fact, a lot in the, uh, primarily in uh, Shakespeare and, 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 and August, a couple of times we'd do a, a scene or a monologue from that. But what I recall him saying is that uh, he had rejected, uh, I believe it was Jitney, was it the first time it was sent to the O'Neill? Is mm-hmm. that this was right? Yeah. Rejected four plays before. Yeah, Brian yeah, Brian. and 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 uh, I remember August saying that uh, you know I mean he was really you know the Midwest Playwright Conference, Dale Wasserman and those people they were saying he this man is a wonderful. He had not gotten that kind of you know, but uh, then he reared back and and wrote uh, uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, and and I remember Lloyd saying that. You said, oh, now he, now he must come. He must come. In fact, Lloyd, um, when he was asked what drew him to August Wilson, said, genius. We were looking for genius. But, Lou, you, you did a number of August Wilson's plays before this. So was there less genius there in the early days? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, those are... Uh, uh, that kind of genius, uh, you're, you're born with the the gray matter to pull it off but it has to be developed mm-hmm. and you've got to be observant and and recognize i think that your heart and and destiny perhaps is pushing you somewhere um that was evident i mean i i read early plays of, of august when he was washing dishes and and writing plays to to teach people about margaret mead and so forth, and they were not very good plays. Yeah. <laughs> he, was, he saw plays as a way to teach. Yeah, when he was at the Science yeah. Museum, sure, sure. And uh, uh, so I did get a chance to watch that. In fact, the first play of his th- that I produced, and it was his first professional production, was a play called Black Bart and the Sacred Hills. And uh, uh, I remember Black Bart in the Sacred Black, Hills. Black Bart in the Sacred Hills. It was a, a western. T- it, well, yeah, it was set <laughs> in the Old West, and it was a takeoff on the Lysistrata yarn, uh-huh. where women withheld sexual favors until men stopped fighting. And it was a tad sexist, maybe just, <laughs> <laughs> just a little. And uh, I, I just rem- before he knew you, Constance. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember people just really walking out. Women, especially, you know, and, and me saying, "Oh my God, this August Wilson! Oh, I'll never do another play like that." <laughs> and but still, one bit of advice he gave me. I'm taking up too much time, but he gave me a bit of advice about the play, and it showed that that he knew 
who he was before other people perhaps knew. And he said, these words are incantations. And any word spoken, even the right word spoken at the wrong time will get you in trouble. Well, I, I was yeah. thinking about Lloyd going through all of these thousand plays and uh, coming up with Ma Rainey. Um, Todd, uh, is, it, is genius easy to spot when you're going through a slush pile of a thousand plays? No. Um, it, it, it's, I, I don't think genius is ever easy to spot, is it? Because it usually is ahead of you. Um, but I think a great voice is really easy to spot. I mean, that's the story that I love that Lloyd told about meeting August was that he recognized the voice in that first play in the first play that I, I don't know whether he rejected all those other plays or his readers at the O'Neill rejected those other plays and Ma Rainey was the first one that got to him. But he, uh, I've heard him tell the story of recognizing the voice and then when the playwrights showed up at the O'Neill Center that summer for the National Playwrights Conference, he had never seen August and he didn't know which one was August and he looked around the uh, uh, the assemblage of playwrights, and August being very light-skinned, he didn't immediately spot the African-American playwright. And he says, when telling the story, Lloyd said, that as soon as he heard August speak, he knew that was August Wilson, because the voice of the man and the voice of the playwright were so much the same. Now, when he wrote Ma Rainey, was he, do you know anyone whether he was thinking about this being part of a cycle? No, he wasn't yet. When did uh, he realize that he was going to do something like that? I can't quite pin down when it was, but I remember you know, him saying, well, I've written um, uh, Ma Rainey, and it was set in the 1920s, and I've written um, Joe Turner, that's set in the, you know, in the teens. And uh, then I think, uh, I think around that time was when the you know, the idea came to him and the great challenge was born mm -hmm. of writing the 10 plays. And so I, I assume that uh, because he died rather young, that he still had other uh, decades to go. Very and much. Did no, he have ideas? Actually, he, he, once he finished Radio Golf, which was the final play in the, in the um, August Wilson uh, American Century Cycle, um, he... Uh, had other plays to write, and they were apart from you know being set in different decades. He wanted to write a novel. He, um, you know, had a play that he called the Coffin Maker play. So, mm. you know, he once he finished one play, he had already started another. He he already was mapping them out in his mind while he was working. No, he had already started. Mm -hmm. You know, so that there was always an overlap. Now, Ebony. Um you you had no idea who this guy was initially, right? When you uh, you tried no, out for those parts, I absolutely did not know you, who he was because he was new to the he was new to that scene as well, and um, I was so fascinated that I was getting the opportunity to audition for Lloyd. <laughs> Richards. Mm -hmm. I mean, I came into theater through musical theater. And I thought, well, oh Lord, I'm going to be doing musicals for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And um, But it's not bad playing Bessie Smith and then Ma Rainey. Well, you know, well yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. But um, there is a different dynamic that goes on in musical theater that I'm not always in favor of, and I wanted, I didn't even know that I wanted to be seen as an actress as well. And um, they gave me an opportunity to be seen as an actress. They welcomed me into the elitist group of actors mm -hmm. and uh, made me feel equal and um, as far as I'm concerned, they offered me my biggest break. What about just delivering the lines that he had written? I loved it because I heard my people. I heard my mom, I heard my dad. I knew those people. I know we all say that because it's true. We, we recognize these people and they're, they're, they are presented in such 
with such dignity and such truth and, and there's no filter. Um, I loved the way that August uh, presented to the white population a different perspective of us. I loved it. Well, he was just putting universal people on the stage. Yes, he was. It is quite universal, yeah. but there's theater, there's black theater that's written for the white audience. And then there's August. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and not only... You want to add to that, Lou? Well, not only did he uh, master the craft and the dramaturgy and the... the he was a poet, yes. so all, the, all that stuff is in there. But the, the inspirational research... You can get in one of these plays or one of those characters and go as deeply in black culture and history as you're capable of going, exactly. and you'll still find more. And that's what, what people find so very satisfying. Not only is it fun to say and mm -hmm. trip you out and yeah. all that kind of stuff, but when you get in there, there's, it's bottomless. Yeah. Well, Constanza, you have uh, called some people Wilsonian warriors. Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, um, I think Ebony just, <laughs> Ebony and Stephen know that. Um, Stephen is a, a, definitely a Wilsonian warrior. Oh, yeah. No, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, there were certain uh, group of actors uh, that August just, you know, sort of brought into the fold. And uh, they were actors that, that's, that, really understood not only what the stories were saying, not only the words, but the struggles, the histories, the um, you know all the magic that it takes to inhabit a, a character in a world, um, it was you know in in their blood, and I would include um, my good friend Anthony and and uh, um, Ruben. Ruben along with that, uh, you know, and so when August died, I was you know held in the arms of these wonderful, you know, people. They were like family. And they are, you know, were willing to give up a lot of the other kinds of, you know, uh, jobs or, or things that come up in their lives to add their artistry to the, to the work. And uh, that's when I started calling them the Wilsonian mm. warriors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't See, go back yeah. to that other stuff. You just can't go back to it. I mean, at, at one stage of the ball game, I just stopped doing musicals. I just stopped. Well, Stephen, is, is being a Wilsonian actor something like being a Shakespearean actor? Does it take a while to really get the rhythms of, well, of the, the line, language and the dialogue? Uh, <laughs> what? A, a few centuries difference. But, no, well, I but, don't mean but, yeah, I just no, mean that there are some no, people I know who just connect immediately. I, you know, I, uh, uh, to me, it's the blues iambic. When the, uh, you talk about the iambic pentameter, you know, and my whole journey as a person, uh, uh, I, I know that uh, I was supposed to be prepared when the opportunity arose that I could work with this great bard of Pittsburgh. And uh, I had trained at uh, Juilliard School. I was in group one, uh, uh, and when they were, you know, the guinea pigs that, that were, you know, Patti LuPone and the whole lot of you know, wonderful actors. But I was there in 68, 69, and uh, I sort of had culture shock. You know, I, I, was, I, was, I played Lear, you know, and, and uh, a lot of other, I mean, it was great experience. But, um, you were young playing. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, we were training. We, oh. You know, it wasn't about, you know, doing it well. It was about <laughs> learning, learning how to do it, you know. And so any part you hit, you know, you say, wow, that's good. You know what I mean? The glass is definitely half full, you know. But, but it wasn't, uh, I wasn't comfortable. And so then I went to the North Carolina School of the Arts, and uh, I was a bit more comfortable. And then I went and trained in England, uh, Rose Buford Academy, and... So I said, okay, now I feel a little better, you know, but uh, uh, when uh, it was all said and done, I was, I was sort of just going around collecting pebbles, getting stuff in my pockets, you know what I mean? <laughs> but when I found August, it was very clear by all my missteps 
you know, all the time in the pool hall and all the time, you know, on the corner and the time at Juilliard and the time in England. So it all started to come together. And uh, it was Esther Roll. I was doing uh, uh, Raising the Sun with Esther and Delroy. And, um, and she, someone didn't have a ticket. Uh, someone she was going to go see Joe Turner with uh, dropped out. And she asked me if I'd like to go. And so, you know, so I went to go because Delroy was in it. And... Uh, and I saw Joe Turner's come and gone, and I heard this exalted language that was also the tongue that my father and my uncle and my grandfather and my grandmother spoke with, you know, and, and you couldn't hardly tell how the poet had tweaked that tongue. It was so authentic, and yet it was as exalted as Sophocles and Shakespeare and anybody else, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I, I really do... Um, I really do think that the, the mission-oriented work, and you know, he came up from a time like he was in the in the black arts movement. He came out of a, as he would say, in the kiln of the mm -hmm. black arts movement, and we were mission-oriented. You know, I mean, it wasn't just protest. You know, a lot of people think, well, we're just trying to be loud and everything. No, it was mission-oriented, and he. It just all comes to what Lou is saying is that, you know, you say one of those lines and, yeah, it sounds good, but that's a deep well, the wisdom that he's drawing from, you know. And that's why revivals uh, can often be just as effective as the originals because mm -hmm. there, it is such a deep well. His work is often compared to Anton Chekhov's, but when I interviewed him, he told me that he had never seen or even read a play by Chekhov. <laughs> and I wonder if that's possible. It, well, you because know, now, he was I, a great playwright. My favorite quote of August's, uh, I mean, in terms, outside of the plays. I mean, he's got great, you see, we got the words hung above the world here. But uh, he said in the Paris Review, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said, when I sit down to write, I sit in the same chair that Sophocles sat in, the same chair that uh, Aeschylus sat in, and he mentioned uh, uh, Ibsen and so on and so forth. Now, it wasn't about that he had read all that, but what he understood was, from a cultural perspective, in the reality you find yourself, that those writers are writing from, you know, about their point of view. And he always said that about his mother's world, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that mm -hmm. his mother's kitchen yeah. and, and that, that all these things were worthy of, uh, of uh, you know, being called art and culture. But, but Todd, he's also a craftsman. I mean, he, uh, there are a lot of very talented wordsmiths who write plays that don't hold together. His plays just worked beautifully. So he, I'm, I'm surprised he had, that he would say he never saw a Chekhov play. Well, I, you think Shakespeare is part of the background? Or, well, I mean, yeah, I, I, mean I, I, I think two things. One is, um, one of the things that so moves me about August, um, both as a man and as, as a playwright, is, is and, and I think maybe it's where that depth that Lou is talking about comes from, is that he, from the very beginning, he is always aware that he is standing in his grandfather's shoes, that he is standing on the shoulders of other people. And that gives him an historical and literary weight and a huge ambition. You know, and then the craft, I mean, I don't know. I didn't take the journey with him the way Lou did or the way um, Lloyd and uh, so many of the actors, the amazing actors who are part of the Warrior family, um, but I, uh, August had, and with Lloyd, and because he was a genius, August, mm -hmm. they created a developmental yes. path for yes. themselves that allowed him to learn on the job in a way no American playwright has ever had exactly. or so will ever so, have again. So, that so was the August was getting from Lloyd at the same yes. time that Lloyd was getting from August? I, I think so. He also had a remarkable, from my, pers my perspective, a remarkable uh, ability to know what he needed and take just that. I mean, I've heard you talk about him having five, six books out, you know, just reading. And, and you know, he wouldn't finish them, perhaps, but he knew what he needed and he knew how to go and get it. You know, and that's a remarkable yes. kind of confidence. And, and in the depth. world, they built a world. I mean, this is really, as somebody who surveys the American theater, they did something no other team has ever done. Exactly. You know, they, they started at the O'Neill, mm -hmm. and August was 
a playwright in residence at New Dramatis and at the Playwright Center in Minneapolis, and he was getting laboratory support there. He had his entire oeuvre being worked on at home in Penumbra. He went to Yale Rep. They created an American theater where Lloyd saw one failing, which would support through the group efforts of the Goodman Theater and the Huntington Theater and ACT in San Francisco, and of course Yale Rep, all the way to Broadway, to the Walter Kerr, wherever, exactly. that, would now, support the is, development. We talk about the Lloyd Richards effect. That yes, is the Lloyd. Yes. Now, here we, now we really hit it. Right? Yes. But if you because talk about the Lloyd Richards effect, you have to include Ben Mordecai. You have to oh, include absolutely. Ben yes. Mordecai. Yes. But, 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 but what Who I'm talking his about, producer. the journey, because the, Ben, I, I met Ben when he ran IRT. He used to be at Indiana Repertory, you know, before mm. he came yes. to Yale, and, and, and Lloyd introduced the two of them. And, see, and, 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 when it, and, and Lloyd put together, you know, from uh, uh, Charles Dutton, Ben Mordecai, mm -hmm. all that, mm -hmm. all that got, got together with August right there. And that, that's a more rainy thing. But Lloyd's journey in the American theater, which was quite unique journey, you see, and what you know, Lloyd would say, because Lloyd could fly. He he did um, um, uh, William Saroyan's "Hello Out There" uh, out in in Detroit, and you know we all know that that play. And it was a play about a. A, a, a lynch mob coming for a guy, but when Lloyd Richards played that role, mm -hmm. you see one of the African Americans in that role, and it became about a lot more, you see, than than what Troy. And so, but he he met a wall. He got to a place where, you know, he, like like you say about Troy, as my brother played so wonderful last night, he come along too early, as mm. they say. So he there wasn't a place for Lloyd Richards' acting career, and we all actors, every actor after that benefited from the fact Absolutely. that Lloyd Richards wasn't able to have that. And Sidney Poitier was the first mm -hmm. that uh, you know who, who who Lloyd taught at Paul Mann's uh, school and so on and so forth. And Lloyd said, that as a man who knew how to fly, who also was a Tuskegee Airman, but as a man who knew how to fly, that he found a great joy in helping others fly. But and that was actors, playwrights, you know, the whole thing, you know. There's also another aspect here. We have a, a black director and a black playwright. Uh, this is a collaboration was quite rare at the time, wasn't it? What, Very much, yeah. The one yeah. thing that I loved about that whole period of time and even about the time before I came on board was the fact that once he was thrown into the O'Neill, it's like, imagine being thrown into a pool of dramaturgs. Just imagine. <laughs> yes. I mean, really. And then, you know, you uh, basic set or none at all, uh, no props. Uh, you embodied everything within yourself. And then the next morning, these people would get up before your eyes are opening really well, and they're discussing it. And so, I mean, oh my God, I know what it did for me. Um, you get thrown into a production, you have several weeks of rehearsal, and that's it. But you had this pool of expertise all around you, and, and you just ate and slept and... Oh, lunch, dinner. Um, I can remember sitting in the uh, in the the lunchroom with Athol Fugard staring at me from across the room. And, I mean, you know, it was just. I, I, I thought I had landed on heaven. You know, so I can only imagine what that must be like for the playwright. Um, and. Every day there'd be volumes. He'd have to go out at, at night when we're finally resting and he's rewriting because they've demanded rewrites. And the next day you spend the first half of the rehearsal filter <laughs> pulling out the old pages and throwing in the new pages. It was, it was like being dropped into a pool of dramatur. Well, there was, a, there was a big age gap between the two of them. Huh? Was um, was Lloyd a kind of almost like a, a father, father. Uh, and and mentor to August at the same time as uh, he was a collaborator? He it may very well have been, but I, I I think that that his contribution to 
building this this body of work um, is multifaceted. For me, the most perhaps the most important part of it was uh, acting as someone to introduce this great work. Right. He knew the places. He had the yes. connections. Yeah. He That's could it. put it in these places. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, August brought a tremendous amount with him, you oh, see. Yeah. <laughs> so once, he, once someone said, here it is, look here, well then, you see what happened. Well, that regional mm -hmm. theater path. That, yeah. that's, that's, oh, that's, 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 well, that's what I'm talking about. That, that's yeah. what I'm saying, yeah. that, that uh, Lloyd's journey had created the goodwill in those places. But all it took ever for anybody with August was to hear his play yeah. you know, and see a production of it and realize that that, that voice. But, but you know, it, it's, um, it, it really is interesting uh, to, 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 to dedicate yourself to building such a platform for voices to come. So that, that you know what I'm saying? But the voice that, that August had was August's Always voice. There. There, there's, there's no question Always about that. There. But it, and he also, this is the humility of the man, to, to have been able to be in Pittsburgh to, in 1996, to go to the Crawford Grill and go to Eddie's restaurant with August and see how the humility of this giant and how he walked among all of us, you know, it was just, you know, so, uh, to have that genius and be that down to earth, that's a quality that, uh, you know, y y that, that, that doesn't come from any university. No. That doesn't come from no. any, any, you know, play. That comes from his mother's house and his journeys to the library. That's what that comes he from. Would, he wouldn't give it up. I've, I've had been at things where, <laughs> where we're trying to open a show and August was going to talk, you know, uh -huh. he'd let me stand between him and the people to try to tax them a little bit. Uh -huh. But um, I'd look for August, and he, <laughs> yes. he'd be out with some cab driver right. sitting, you know, smoking or telling is. lies with somebody, yeah. you know. I mean, he, he just never lost that. Never. Yeah, in, never. In, in the rehearsal process, I, I still see August milling around in the back. He's in the back of the room right now, because that's where he was. He would just pace back and forth, and then he would disappear. You know he went outside to smoke a cigarette or talk to somebody. Oh, my God. Uh, Yale Rep was a, a noted incubator for plays, a place where work could be developed and without, you didn't have to worry about money pressures of, of Broadway. Uh, was the, the goal usually to eventually take the work to Broadway? Uh, you know, I, I believe the hope was. You know, the, the, hope, the open hearted hope, hope. Uh, to develop these plays good enough so that uh, investors and producers would get interested. Um, once, you know, Ma Rainey went to Broadway and then Joe Turner and then we had Fences, um, you know, I think that uh, even. Uh, reviewers that would come to the beginning plays at Yale would sit there, you know, and they'd immediately speculate about how it would be when they got to New York. Um, so it just started a, a ball rolling. But originally, I think it was a hope rather than, a, you know, a is, certainty. Is there anything like that today? I, I, I mean, things start at the public theater and then wind up making that move. But the public theater is already a pretty high profile situation. A couple of theaters in LA, I think that people are willing to to uh, experiment with uh, things, but there's nothing like Yale Rep anymore, is there? Well, no. There well, are... no. Uh, you know, the thing is, you're saying Yale Rep. You mean you mean the uh, the O'Neill? Yeah, the O'Neill. Yeah, but there are plenty of O'Neill. See, here's the thing: because of what was built at the O'Neill, the Sundance uh, mm -hmm. summer uh, playwright developing thing. I mean, that's sun, that's a fabulous thing. I was a part of that. But at the Midwest Playwright Conference, uh, Lou, I'm sure you know mm -hmm, what Dale Wasserman mm -hmm, had up there. Mm -hmm. No, the model was set. Mm -hmm. that, that's really the, the reality of it, that, that Lloyd and uh, uh, George White, they, they built, they, they established a model to nurture playwrights. And, uh, and the other thing that I love that, that, uh, that Lloyd would say, and I, that Todd was sort of alluding to this about, you say, I don't know whether Lloyd really rejected those plays or whether the readers, right, did, it did, right, when right. did it get to him? But Lloyd was, was talking about admonishing uh, some readers once. He told me, he said, when someone came to him and said, uh, 
yeah, I read the play, and that, you know, after the first 20 pages, it didn't, it didn't grab me. And Lloyd, you know, who was a very quiet man, but he could be very severe, you know what I mean? <laughs> it wasn't that he got loud, but he got severe. And he said that we are not here to entertain you as a reader. Mm -hmm. He says, if you read the entire play and you come to the last scene, and that's the scene that you hear the voice of the playwright, then we want to call that person because we might want to tell them, start here, start mm -hmm, with this mm -hmm, scene. Mm -hmm. But he was about you know, nurturing that voice. Then when he got someone who had all the scenes in order, you know what I'm saying, who, who really you know, had his work together, because um, uh, I, I, uh, I remember hearing uh, uh, Amiri Baraka, because you know, he, he and uh, you know, August was talking about the, the, the the four Bs? Yeah. Well, three four Bs. Yeah, four, yeah. Four. Four. Yeah, it's four. Yeah, it's four. Yeah. Borges, yeah. Baldwin, Bur yes. Bur uh, and the Blues. Baraka. And the Blues. And Baraka the blues. and the Blues. And Baraka and the Blues. Baraka. And so yes. when, I, when I met August, uh, uh, you know, I was a cat from Kansas City, ran into him in Pittsburgh, and, I, and his sister introduced me to him, and he wanted to know if I was for real. You know, he said, man, you, you really? You, you for real? I said, yeah, man, I'm, I'm in it. And he says, well, well, you know, well, you know, you know, I'm Mary Baraka. I said, oh, yeah, I know I'm Mary. He says, no, I mean, you know, his poet. I said, yeah, but I know him, too. What? You mm -hmm. met him? You, you know, I said, well, yeah, well, I met him back when we were doing that blamming like that. But he's, he needed me to quote. He wanted to hear it. And he needed to hear the poetry. And then he joined in and that. So the, the, what he was a part of, the thing that was happening in this country, what August really was a real part of, was the black arts movement. Mm -hmm. And when you put that together, the regional theater movement, okay, was happening at the same time as the black arts movement, and Lloyd's involvement with the regional theater movement, and August's culmination of the black arts movement, and when those two things came together, and, 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 and Dutton came out, and, 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 and as Constanza said, and Ben Mordecai fell in place, mm -hmm. that this was a, a perfect storm for perfect. art. Yes. That, when you say that, Dutton came out, he came out of prison and immediately Well, I just himself. say came out of Baltimore. You said that. <laughs> 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 he established well, himself as a, as a major Yale. actor, <laughs> playing in August Wilson. Yale. Also, yeah. Leonard, I want to go back to your, your question about is this happening now in terms of things moving yeah. to Broadway. It's really, I think, important to establish what's so different about what they did. Um, right now, there are lots of plays that move to Broadway that are enhanced by producers. They made a very clear decision early on, and it's an interesting story because that Ma Rainey story Lloyd was under his own oath not to ask for the rights to produce that at Yale while they were at the O'Neill together. Mm. So he waited a week or something before calling August to see if he could do this. This is the story, as uh, Lloyd would tell it. And um, by that time, there was a commercial producer involved. And the negotiations lasted for six months or so and then broke down and then Lloyd did it. But the way that Lloyd tells the story, they... Um, they created this pathway in order to not have to deal with the commercial voice mm -hmm. in the process. Mm -hmm. So somebody puts money up and they want to say, but when you're August Wilson and you're Lloyd Richards and you've worked for three or four years on a play, you don't need their say. Yeah, that was what mm -hmm. my question was earlier, uh, you know, working without the pressures of economic constraints. Right. So they created their own financial model, essentially, which was partnering up with these regional theaters, which was, you know, partnering up then with commercial producers at the back end through Ben. And meanwhile, I mean, I, 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 it's kind of weird to talk about this because Lloyd's effect was so huge on creating this world. But meanwhile, Lou was producing all the plays at Penumbra, too. So we're talking about worlds that are happening simultaneous yeah. yes. to you know, each and, other. And one of the challenges, of course, that, that although the, that perfect storm happened, there was no, no established uh, or a relationship between a black writer and the regional theater right. companies right. until August until got then, there. Yeah. And, right. and so that... Uh, this the, having the courage to hold and follow one's heart 
through those permutations when people are looking for happy endings and a different kind of black individual to be portrayed on stage is, uh, is really, really powerful. I, I work with new playwrights today and we develop plays at Penumbra still. And you'd be surprised at the number of playwrights that I come across who say, I could have had this play produced had I had a different ending on it. Mm -hmm. But I can come to Penumbra or and one of those cultural institutions right. and then mm -hmm. find that ending and follow that truth mm -hmm. to where mm -hmm. it, it needs to go. But he was able to do it in the regional circuit, which is really something. Yeah. Constanza, how many uh, plays did you wind up designing the costumes for? <laughs> oh, gosh, I've n I haven't stopped to count it, but um, uh, I'd say about four or five, yeah. And when you see revivals, are they pretty much going back to what you did and doing well, knockoffs yeah, it's, of, it's, of your designs? Well, I don't, I don't want to, you know... Uh, it's okay. <laughs> just any of my Tell the fellow truth. costume designers. But uh, one of the things that I, do, I did so much enjoy with August is my collaboration with him. Um, you know, he... We own a, a very large house, and I would have my own studio, and he had his uh, studio, and he'd often visit me. I, I wasn't allowed to visit him too much. Um, while he was working. <laughs> while he was, yeah, yeah. He late, worked li late into the night, but, um, you know, he'd look at some of my sketches, and then he'd look at them closely and said, wow, I love this sketch. And then he said, I'm going to go downstairs and write m this character to look more like the sketch. <laughs> Whoa. You know, so, so that was the kind of collaboration we had and there's a lot of um, things that uh, I basically made choices for the looks of the plays which you know got written up in the in the scripts you know like Floyd appears in the middle of the night wearing a white suit um, and then it, it become these are my choices and then they became the way that you know historically they're done when no. we worked at signature and you did those posters Right. That's when I really began to see the, the kind of, that, that influence that you mm -hmm. had. I'll never forget those. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, really what wonderful. What happened to their, their collaboration? Why did it end? Uh, Lloyd and yeah. in August? So, well, I, I, you know, let's take any father and son you know, you. relationship. <laughs> I think, you know, I, I don't want to overstate the father and son, but you know, you had an older gentleman, you have a younger gentleman, there's different energies going on. And, uh, you know, even in, we just read uh, Fences last night, you know, we had uh, Corey walk out of the backyard. And that's what every journey is for a younger generation is to take their own path, basically. I'm going to, uh, in a, a few moments, uh, take some questions from the audience. Um, you've been filling out the cards? Have cards been handed out to be filled out? Well. No, we have somebody, a gentleman back there. Okay, well, well when I, but first um, we have two other people we would have loved to have had on the panel in the audience, and I'd like to talk to them for a moment. We have Anthony Chisholm, who um, has been in how many... August Wilson plays? Seven. Seven? Seven, seven, seven. Uh, <laughs> so you... Uh, over a period of... Uh, created also many roles. Over and a period of uh, 23 years, since 1990, mm -hmm. and 58 cities, mm -hmm. sitting down uh, two, three months per city. I have a feeling that there were all sorts of things you wanted to add to the conversation. Uh, but couldn't. Well, now here's your chance. <laughs> well, I, I'm a storyteller, so I could talk here for hours, but um, uh, if going back to Lloyd for a moment, I first met Lloyd uh, right after I moved to New York, late 60s. And I auditioned for the Negro Ensemble Company for one man only, Douglas Turner Ward. And when I finished, he says, okay, he says, I don't have a spot for you right now in the professional company, but I want to put you in our, our master acting class. Because he had three levels, three different teachers. And it was Lloyd's class. So that's when I met him, along with uh, some other notables, including Mary Alice, Richard Roundtree, who did the original Shaft movie. 
um, there was only about 12 in the class, but I, I took him for two years, two, day, two days a week for two years, four hours uh, a session. And um, a lot of the things he said back then I didn't understand uh, because he was speaking in high academic terms. <laughs> and you know, it just wasn't coming through. Was he also whispering a lot? <laughs> well, he was a soft-spoken man, as everyone mentioned. Um, I don't recall him whispering, but uh, he uh, was soft-spoken, and um, he had a way. I remember he used to tell us to listen to uh, the traffic out the street and people talking out there and project ourselves uh, to that place and imagine. And um, anyway, moving on, I didn't see him again after those two years until I finally had a chance to audition for an August Wilson play. And that was the fifth one out of the, out of the box. Uh, uh, Ma Rainey and Fences and uh, Joe Turner and, and, and Piano Lesson had already been uh, produced, but uh, I, I went and auditioned for Two Trains Running, my first time to audition for a lady named Meg Simon. When I had to audition across her desk, she could have said, thank you very much. And that would have been the end of it. Mm -hmm. But she, she started making notes. She says, okay, I'm gonna, I'm putting you down for 310 on Wednesday to meet the playwright <laughs> and, the, and the director. So I prepared my little monologue and, and um, I went in and um, there was August, there was Lloyd. It was, I can't describe the feeling, but it was an emotional feeling. And um, I did my little monologue and, and I ran into a mental blank because I memorized the thing. <laughs> and he says, you don't have to memorize it. He says, just, you're sitting at the counter having a cup of coffee. You know, he was just, I got angry inside because of the way he was um, uh, scolding me at the same time. But anyway, I did it, and he said, thank you. And I was walking out of the rehearsal hall when he grabbed my sleeve, and he said, wait a minute. He says, I see uh, here on the resume that uh, you studied with me. He said, when did you study with me? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, come on, Lloyd, man. Would, would Mary Alice and, and Richard Dalton? Oh, God. He said, that was a million years ago. <laughs> he says, thank you. And I left. Well, long story short, the first production of that at Yale Rep, Samuel L. Jackson did. But I did all the rest of them after that, <laughs> including New York City. Mm -hmm. And um, it was an experience. Um, he was soft-spoken, and he did carry a big stick <laughs> because uh, you could feel the power under, inside of him, even though he would just look at you with a subtle uh, glance. You felt him. And um, uh, the world lost, um, and I hope it retains at the same time, some of the knowledge that he uh, passed on to pupils and fellow artist, yeah, he was a giant, as well as August. And he was a, a, a mentor to him, because um, you know, August was coming into a, a, another arena from Minnesota, and he comes into the arms of Lloyd Richards. <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, and, and the machinery that Lloyd put together with Mordecai to tour uh, a half a dozen regional theaters and get them, uh, combine them as producers, you know, and then it, it was a more impressive package to present to the other producers when it was time to do that. And um, he, he became a legend because the artistry that lived within him still lives and it was in his writing so profound that um, the, uh, the, the powers that be could feel it. They invested in that. 
and even, and but they didn't spend enough money marketing and I, I don't want to go into the negative but I, I just felt that they should have spent more money marketing the, the Lion King would not be a hit if you didn't advertise Oh, well, it costs money. It costs. That's the truth. Well, we, I want to get Ruben in here too, and, and I, 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 should, I should point yeah. out that August Wilson is not an unknown playwright, so there has been some marketing. Um, Ruben Santiago Hudson is artistic director of the August uh, Wilson's American Century Cycle here at the Green Space, and uh, Ruben, you've become one of the leading interpreters of uh, his plays in recent years. Didn't you start out acting? In them, you were you won a Tony for seven guitars in 1996. Well, yes, I did. Uh, you know, it was a blessing. Uh, let me just talk about. To me, that's you, you know that's I, this is what I like to say in the limited time that Cheers left me. Um, <laughs> the, let me let me let me just say this. This is the reason I this is the reason I suggested this panel. Yes, it's clear. It's clear to us all that August was a genius. Mm -hmm. That genius had to be developed. There had to be a man to insulate him from the harsh reality of this business, mm -hmm. to give him an opportunity to learn, to nurture his craft, to, to, to take the hits from him so he can take the time to develop these plays, the arc, the dramaturgy. That was afforded before I love Ben, God bless all the people that helped him get to Broadway. I'm not talking about Broadway. I'm talking about what made it feasible, what made it attractive, what made it something that people wanted because the, the work was stunning. It didn't come out stunning. The voice was there. We've all heard these stories of these, these incredible black men who can sit up and weave the best tales in the world. You know, in Nanny's room and house, I heard them. August heard them at, at Pat's place. But listen to me. Without the opportunity to have Edith Oliver originally as his dramaturg, right. then Michael Feingold, and these people talking about the arc of theater, the arc of character, the development of beats, characters, scenes, you know, how can you take a character and, and he comes in with a white suit and he just walked out the last scene with a yellow suit on. So, so he had the opportunity for dramaturgy to tell him, we need to create a little buffer here. So without the O'Neill, the opportunity to wake up and talk theater, to go to sleep and talk theater, to see other, other writers who have done this, to sit there and develop relationships with, 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 with a, a, a Lenny and Romulus Lenny and, and other, other writers. This was provided to him. This is, today, today these, these writers are jumping out and they're crowning them as the next coming and they ain't been nowhere but here and there. Yeah, that's right. You know, and it's like, that's and they right. got the attitude about it too. I talked to them. Mm -hmm. I talked to a lot of them. One writer said to me, forget it, I don't want to talk about August Wilson no more. He's dead. And I, and I, and I say to them, if, if, they were, if August hadn't done what he's done, they wouldn't pay no attention it to your button. That, 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 right? And that's a reality. He had an opportunity and he was chosen and God, something bigger than you and me, tapped Lloyd on the shoulder and said, that's the one. That's yeah. right. And because of that moment in 1982, we're sitting here tonight. That's right. That's right. A couple of questions from the audience. This person writes, it may be obvious, but what was the impact of Pittsburgh on his opus, especially the city that it was in the 1950s, uh, a time the, the writer says he or she remembers. What was the effect of Pittsburgh on him? Yeah, well, Pittsburgh well, is, is right. at the center of all the... You know, I mean, there's only one play that's, that's set otherwise, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's, that's in Chicago. But not... then he moved to Seattle. Oh, yeah, but I mean, he still kept writing about Pittsburgh. I mean, that was his ancestral home. That's where his mother raised him. And he uh, lived within the Hill District where uh, he saw the community uh, evolve from a very vibrant community to a community that was, um, uh, that started to have blighted sections of it and had, you know, was devastated by political, um, you know, uh, the political network. So. And then in golf, he, he sees a, a, a gap between the successful and the people. Yes who still are not making it. Right. Um, he, even, he even said that, that he heard those voices Absolutely. more clearly from Minnesota. Or, yes, exactly. Or there was, uh, there was yeah. a effect of you know, being removed from it. He could yeah. hear the voices a lot cl more clearly. And, and, but those characters, the people he grew up in, the people he, the older gentleman that he heard in the, bar, in the barbershop, uh, those people had been instilled in his brain and in his memory already. And you go there, 
you do, it was it blew me away. I'd been you know I've done so many of these plays, but then you go to Pittsburgh, and those are the real people. <laughs> I mean, right. when, when he uses a name in two yeah. trains or something about West Mr. Or. Somebody who yeah. who taught somebody, or in Radio Golf, the guy who 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 uh, yeah. brought him oh, through well, the school. And stuff. That's a real man. I'll they claim him. I can tell you, we we, we did Jitney down there, and. Um, and it was a little section that he has where Turnbull says he's trying to get uh, feel, uh, somebody, to, uh, 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 Sheila, to remember. He said, you know that boy, you know, uh, that lived over such. He said, you know, that with the funny shaved head. Yeah. Now, now we did that show down there, and after the show, this gentleman called me and said, that's my uncle, man. That, <laughs> <laughs> that dude with that head, that dude with that head. But the, for the, way, that they, the way that they were claimed, sure. you know, they claim it, and they know, and uh, to have seen... The people standing on the street when that procession. Wasn't it? We oh drove my God. to see him step oh out, to God. see a, a guy holding Ooh. his baby up Ooh. and had his grandmother holding the door for her Ooh. to come out and with for them signs. to watch it. With and holding signs. up holding, holding up, up signs, signs. holding up the original oh. paper. The first time he won a Pulitzer Prize, somebody had the Ooh. paper that had that, holding it up. You know, it, it, it just not yeah. P Pitts, Pittsburgh was in him and, and, and he was all in Pittsburgh. He was right. in Pittsburgh. We we as as African people in this country, we, we've always had to whisper in the corners, and, 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 and America has always looked at us in a glancing look. And August took and thrust us directly in front of you and, and, and gave us an arena there where we had a voice that was loud, unapologetic, and we were proud mm -hmm. to be who we were. You know, through all the scuffles, salt of the earth people. And so this opportunity for us to have a loud, clear, resonant voice without apologies, with in incredible integrity, no matter what your lot was, August provided that. And I said to a gentleman today when he was interviewing me, I said, in the last 30 years, name me five original plays other than August Wilson. And he couldn't. And I said, and you're a critic. You, he got to three. And I said, if I put a pistol to your head right now, you could name two more. And he couldn't. So August filled that void. Yes. But Ruben, the thing that made August